as a reminder, if you have any questions about uh, the hackathon, in addition to the projects or setup or just contact info, the link I have here is to the official CHAC website, chack.org. Um, and so all the info should be there. So as a preview, uh, I have this tutorial notebook divided up into four main sections. Uh, the first is talking about coding slash Python. The second is about introducing Jupyter Notebooks. The third is going to be the breakout room questions, and that's going to happen after the main lecture. Uh, and then the fourth one is going to be a list of resources related to what we're covering today. I'll talk more about those list of resources, but uh, let's get started with coding. So put very broadly, uh, we write computer code to perform a set of tasks and instructions that the computer can help us accomplish. And if that sounds too generic, then you're right. <laughs> I just gave you a very overly simplistic term. Now, the real challenge of coding is just everything after that, of course, and that, that's the coding itself, knowing what tools to use, identifying the problem that needs to be solved, and then just figuring out what you don't know, meaning just figuring out what you need to learn in order to get to the solution. By joining this hackathon, I would assume you see at least some value of learning about programming. Uh, I'm glad that Chris Turner earlier from Micron made a great point in that when he was mentioning coding in Python, he said it's becoming an essential skill, and I do agree with that. So our hope as instructors this week uh, is to build that foundation to at least go through the process of a particular problem we have in line for you with the projects. Uh, and along the way, just help you understand why we're focusing on these particular concepts and tools. I'll start by introducing you to the programming language that you'll be using for the hackathon, which is Python. My hope here is by giving you an introduction to Python, by the way, this is also by extension, giving you an introduction to coding. Uh, a lot of the programming concepts that we'll be covering, not just today, but later on, such as uh, functions and data visualization uh, can be carried over to other languages. So it's just something to keep in mind throughout the week. But uh, with Python, the the benefits of Python is that it is a general purpose programming language. Uh, the syntax for Python is understandable to read, and it is easy to learn compared to other languages you might find, such as Java, C, C++. And then for the hackathon, you'll find that with Python, this is really ideal for data science. So topics like data science, machine learning, and data visualization, which is going to be covered later on this week, we're going to be utilizing Python. Um, and just a quick note here, I put this here just to get this out of the way. So the tutorial is covering the syntax for version three of Python. So if you ever after this are going to be out seeking other resources of Python out, out there, just be aware that Python version two is no longer supported. So you might find older tutorials and books that are going to be outdated as a result. So I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way. But to dive right in, um, in syntax, Let's start with the basic function that's pretty easy to understand and provides some uh, simple uh, immediate feedback, the, the print function. And this is also at the same time discussing a little bit about Jupyter Notebooks, but don't worry, we'll get to that section in just a bit. But printing output to the console is just as simple as using that print function. And in the parentheses here, which is part of the syntax for running a function in Python, is whatever it is that you want to print out. Uh, in the case of uh, this notebook, if you wanted to execute a code cell, meaning if you wanted to run the code cell, you can either click on this play button here uh, next to the cell, or you can use the keyboard shortcut control enter uh, on Windows. And if you're on Mac, it's going to be command enter. But in here, I'm just going to hit the play button, and you're going to see what happens eventually. We'll see. Maybe. OK. <laughs> That shouldn't take that long if you're on a local computer. But <laughs> here in this case, you get immediate feedback where it says, hello, C hack coders. So this echoes out whatever you put inside the parentheses, and that's what the print function does. Variables can be uh, created just by typing the name of it as you'd like. And variables is just going to be the very next section after this. So um, I'm just giving you a little preview of what we'll be covering. But it's going to help us store and reference data uh, for later use. But if I wanted to create a variable to store information, let's say I wanted to create a variable called sum school, sum underscore school, and I wanted to set it to the value of University of Washington in double quotes, uh, I would put the name of the variable that I wanted, followed by the equal sign, and followed by the value that I wanted. 
And this is what's called assigning the variable to value or initializing it. So when I hit the play button, you notice there's no output, and that's the point. This is just initializing the variable. This is not going to give us, this is not going to spit out either the variable name or uh, the string value unless there's an error that we come across. But in this case, we don't have it. So you may then want to use that creative variable elsewhere. And in this case, let's use it as part of the function we just learned earlier. We want to output the value set for some school by inputting that variable name into uh, Python's print function. So in order to do that, I'm going to use the print function again. But this time, instead of typing hello C hack coders, I'm just going to put in the name of the variable that I just created one cell ago, which is some school. And that should print out, as you can guess, University of Washington. This takes a step further by just outputting what we initialized earlier here. And all pretty simple stuff, but um, this is just to give you kind of a preview, at least the basics of the syntax here. A key part of coding is just understanding which functions you need to use for accomplishing a particular task and knowing when to create one of your own. But that's going to be covered later this week. What I just gave you was a very basic example of a, a function that is built into Python that is already available for us. So let's start with the first exercise. So if everyone uh, has their keyboards ready, let's go through our first uh, coding exercise and let's try typing print hello world in the empty code cell below. Um, and by the way, yeah, so I, I want to mention to you, as we're using the interface, we're also kind of learning uh, Google Colab and the notebook environment. But uh, you can expect me to cover this later on in the section more in depth. But here in this case, I'm just going to type print hello world. Uh, there is auto completion uh, here in Google Colab, which is great. So oftentimes you may find that closing parentheses is completed for us. So auto completion uh, does come in handy here. And even after you type it, it will still it won't type another one. It will just complete it for you anyway. So now that that's finished up, just double check everything, and then I'm going to hit the play button, and this should print out "Hello World." It's obligatory because uh, I'm sure if you run into other programming language tutorials, uh, they, they'll go through this very first step of trying to print out world. So not so obligatory if you're learning for the first time and you're just trying to get comfortable here. OK. So let's talk about um, the variables here. Uh, and that is section 1.1.3. So as coders, you know, one goal is to make you know, constant computations or processes happen that require the same piece of certain information or data at multiple steps without us as users inputting it every time we're interviewing. So in order to do that, we need to be able to put that info somewhere on our computer stored in memory while we're coding and try to make those same computations or processes happen. And this is where variables come in. The thing in bold is kind of what I just explained more in detail is to have values that our computer can store in memory, we use what's called variables. So otherwise, we wouldn't be able to reference those values that we need later on. Uh, and this is an essential part of programming. We just went through one example of it earlier. That was that some school example. And I'm going to give another example here where, oops, sorry about that. Um, to create and assign a variable, uh, we'll use the equal sign operator. And that's to help initialize a variable. So I'll start with a variable called x and give it an integer value of 25. Uh, and I remember to hit the play button, otherwise that's not going to initialize it. OK. Uh, simple example. Another simple one is I'm going to create another variable called city underscore name and assign it the word Seattle. And then when we need to use these values again, uh, we retrieve that variable by referring to it by the variable name that we gave it when we first assigned it, which we did earlier, again, with some school. So that x variable we made can be used later, and we can use it as many times as we like. But in addition, we can also modify those existing variables. So let's try and do that. Let's change the value of x after we print its initial value. So what this cell should do is after it prints this, or after it runs this print statement, we should first see 25. And then when I change the value of x to 150, instead of seeing 25 again, we're going to see 150. And that's what we get. So using the equal sign operators, operator, 
is also used for modifying or replacing uh, variables of the same name. And let's do the same thing for the city name variable that we created earlier. Let's assign it a different value too. So first off, it should print out Seattle. And then I'm just going to go change it to Mexico City. And then if I play, we should see Seattle and then Mexico City. And the point here that I just made it in this text cell is um, you print it a second time. This should indicate that the initial value has changed. So basically, if this said Seattle second time, um, that meant that you did not change the value of city name. OK, so now let's dive in and talk more about those types of variables. So what we did was just kind of show two different types of variables. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, these are more of the common data types in Python. Uh, so the first one I want to discuss is a string. So we've seen that before from not only some school, but city name. So strings in Python, you can just think of them as a collection of characters just wrapped around quotes. And a string can represent any kind of info depending on how it is used, uh, such as a person's name, uh, the name of the city like we just showed before, or a complete sentence. So uh, below here, I just have examples of four string variables that I type below. Uh, I have another variable called another city name set equal to Gotham. Uh, I have an example sentence that says this is a sentence. I have another sentence <laughs> equals to this is another sentence. And then I have some name equal to Michael Scott. So if I hit play here, this should initialize those variables, meaning we can use those variables later on, whether we need to print it or put it in another function. Uh, the other two variable types that I'll discuss for now are integers and floats. The integer in this case, you just want to think of them as data that can represent any positive or negative whole number. So do you remember the x value we made earlier? That would be an integer. So that variable would be considered an integer in Python because of the initial value we gave it. And below here are some examples of some Python integer variables. So for example, it can represent a number, which I called some int. It could represent a zip code, which the variable zip code I have is just represents um, the zip code for the UW campus, or it could represent some monetary values, such as the dollar amount for the contract of NFL quarterback Patrick Mahomes. And yes, that's $502 million. <laughs> so it could represent anything. And then there's something called a, a float in Python, and that's considered any number with decimal point values. And this is going to be the main difference between a float and an integer. Now, the examples I have here, I kind of explain them as I go, but for for talking about those decimal point values, some examples are going to show an arbitrary number of decimal places after that point. And then there are going to be ones less than uh, one, and but they don't necessarily require the zero left of decimal point. So the, the y equals 21.0, that's going to be a float. And if I were to say that's going to be, uh, if, that's, if this is going to be 21 and that's it, then that would be an integer. But in this case, this would be a float. And then half in this case is 0 0.5. I'm going to set that equal. Um, to the variable name half, and that's going to be a float as well. Uh, you can have the value of pi here. I can't remember how many digits I went past. I went on some website, but I just gave up after I think 15. But um, it can be as many numbers as you like, and that's going to set equal to pi. And then you can have something specific like I have here, again, sports related is 0.398, which is the field goal percentage of NBA player Paul George during the 2021 playoffs. Uh, and this is an example where there is not a zero at the end, but this will still be valid syntax. We'll go ahead and play that. Python is a language where the variables are dynamically typed. And what, that, what I mean by that is you don't need to declare the specific type of variable when you initialize it at the time. So, what I, so to kind of explain that further, I didn't have to say float half equals 0.5. Or earlier, I didn't have to say string some name equals Michael Scott. Other languages like Java and C and C++, they require you to initialize the type. So one benefit of Python that um, uh, is the reason why, uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, why it's become so popular is because of that feature is that it's dynamically typed. You don't have to worry about specifying that in the syntax. So when we executed x equals 25, that automatically turned into an integer because the value is 25. And because that's a whole number, that's going to turn into an integer. So likewise, if I were to say instead x equals 25.0, um, that's going to make it a float type because of the 0, 0. 
And you can check the type of any existing variable. Uh, it could use what's called a type function in Python. That's built in. Uh, the city name variable we created earlier, we can confirm that type if we run the function type and then put in the name of the variable. And that should give us, I'm going to play it, str, which represents string in Python. So it's not going to say the string before, it's just going to say str. But that gives you an idea of uh, how you can check the type of a variable, especially if you have code that you're collaborating with others. Um, that can be very useful. But that's an example of a very simple function. I don't want to get too much into functions, but um, that's just one example of it. So exercise two, let's create our own variables. Let's start by initializing a variable called 100 and assign it an integer value of 100 in the code cell below. So I'm going to do 100 equals 100. OK, so that should work. Again, we don't get any output because we're just initializing the variable. And then the next variable, we're going to create uh, one called best school. And we're going to assign the string value of University of Washington. So I'm going to do best. Okay. Uh, another simple exercise, but if you play it, this is just to demonstrate these are how you can create your own variables. And the breakout rooms are going to dive more into that, too. OK. And as a reminder, there are much more data types to explore in Python. So these are clearly not the only ones. Um, and there are others out there that are ones both built into Python and then ones uh, created by open source libraries, uh, external libraries. Now I want to talk about math with Python, but I'm going to check uh, really quickly if there's any questions here that were sent to me. Nope. OK. So let's talk about math. With Python. Right. Um, I'll just check with uh, Nina sure. and Evan. Did you get any questions? Nope. No. I have. Nope. I'm just double checking. I think I heard two. I'm notes. seeing the nods from both. Yeah. I just <laughs> I have, a, I have a, a question for you, Jesse. Um, for those of, let's say, if I had never coded in Python, you know, when you wrote 100 equals 100, could you have called that variable a different name? Like, is that up to the user? Yes, good question. So all these variable names are arbitrary. OK. Um, so if I were for some reason to name 100 equals 100 instead of 20 equals 100, um, I could have done that same thing. Now, whether that makes sense, that's at the discretion of the user coding it, but um, they are arbitrary. Thanks. Very good question. And of course, you want the variable names to make sense, I, I would think at least. But maybe that's just me. I think okay. you a good nod from Dave. <laughs> <laughs> a good nod from Dave, yeah. So math with Python, um, there are all kinds of mathematical operations you can code with Python from the start. And in more complex mathematical work, there are external libraries available. But here, I'm just going to go over briefly some of the syntax in Python to perform some of the basic math. Uh, and you might find with tutorials that deal with this uh, kind of concept is uh, you can almost use Python just like a calculator. But to start with the most basic operation, if we add one with one, we can do that by using the plus sign, which uh, is the operator for addition in uh, Python. Self-explanatory, but this should output two. And for subtraction, you can do the same thing, only uh, in, the, in the, this type of syntax, you're going to use the minus sign. It also works uh, just like how you expect here. So if I were to run, 45 minus 32, you would get a value of 13. Uh, multiplication, and by the way, other languages kind of share the same operator syntax. Um, you'll, you'll find if you ever learn other languages uh, down the road. But for multiplication, you're going to use the asterisk in Python. So if I did 12 asterisk 90, that's the same thing as 12 times 90. If I hit the play button, that's going to equal 1080. And you can combine as many. Uh, math operators uh, in one line as you'd like. So I'm not going to say all these, but if I were to run all these, I would assume it's going to give me the, uh, the right answer. And based on the data type, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about, again, about data types uh, again when I try to bring this both of these things back together. But based on the data type, you can perform the same math operation for variables. So suppose I create a variable a equals 12 and um, b equals uh, 24. 
and let's say they're already defined, I can multiply the two variables together by simply referring to their names and using the uh, asterisks like so, A asterisk B. So this is the code cell of what I just explained here. Um, so I have first A equals 12, uh, B equals 24, and then A asterisk B. So if I hit the play button here, this is the same thing as saying uh, 12 times 24, which should give us uh, 280. So this is just to show you don't have to hard code the numbers. You can set them equal to variables and still use the math operators that I just demonstrated here. OK, moving on to exercise three. So this time, this uh, exercise is just to kind of help uh, discover two on your own. Um, so for the first one, let's try typing 14 slash 4 here. and Let's see what it gives us. Play button. So 3.5, as you might guess, um, if you look at it, that means it's dividing it. Uh, so just by typing the computation here, and when we see the output is 3.5, you can recognize that the slash is a division operator. Now, for some of you who are already uh, more advanced than Python, yes, I do recognize there's another division operator. That's why I said a division operator it is not the division operator. But We'll we'll get to that in the breakout room, but I just want to just point out because there I'm I'm sure there's going to be uh, someone pointing that out. But yes, the slash the single slash is just one division operator. So let's try those same two numbers again, but instead of the slash, let's do a percent sign. So if I did fourteen uh, percent four, let's see what that gives us. So this gives us a value of two. So what the percent sign does, and for those of you who may already jumped ahead to the, the fourth section, already maybe see the, uh, the table of math operators, the uh, percent sign is uh, giving you the remainder if you were to divide one number by the other. So if you did 14 divided by 4, um, you know the remainder is going to be 2. So just looking at this, the percent sign now, as you can tell, is the, the remainder operator. Okay. Uh, I'll move on to XRS4, but I did have a, I just got a question here that I'm now seeing. Let's see. What is a library? I hope you don't mean library like a school library, Evan, or you mean a library like a Python library. I'm assuming it's the, the second one. The only thing I'll say for a library here is a library in Python is just a collection of code that you can use that has uh, different function or objects that you can uh, take advantage of later for when you need to perform some certain task. So when we talk about external libraries, um, those aren't necessarily ones built into Python, but ones you can install and download from elsewhere. And that gives you access to certain codes and functions that you can uh, uh, use on your own. Um, so I don't want to get more into kind of diving into that question. But uh, later on, I do kind of talk about uh, some of the external libraries that you'll see for Google Colab. Um, but hopefully, I think that should answer at least the uh, base part of the question, Evan. I have a question for you also, uh, Jesse. So you showed us a lot of cool stuff with these um, operations like pluses and products. Can I define a variable equal to one of these uh, cells? That's a very good question. Let's, uh, should we try it? Let's try it. <laughs> let's try it, all right. So we're gonna do a little detour here. Let's create a, a new code cell here and let's try it. Um, Cause that, that's also a good question is, can you, uh, so I'll add on to that question is, can you create the variables based on reserved keywords and operators? So if I did x equals percent sign, um, this is what it gives me. So if I did x equals plus, or let's just do slash. Let's try that. So we get what's called invalid syntax or a syntax error. There are certain keywords and operators in Python that you cannot set it equal to, including like creating variable names that are already reserved in Python, because those give you errors. So in answering to your question, Stephanie, about whether we can use these operators and set it equal to them, we can't. And then vice versa, too. You can't say slash equals four or percent sign equals four. Um, that doesn't work because we're going to get an error from that. But how about, for example, you calculated in your cell 21, 14% four, right? Mm -hmm. And 
uh, could you have stored that into a variable? Now that we can do, yes. So that, that sounds a little bit better. So if we did 14% uh, sine four, and if uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and print out um, what that equals to or the variable name. So we hit the play button here. And again, what, what she asked was, can we set this value equal to a variable? Uh, can we store it? And yes, we can. And that gives us value two. So all of these math operators, you can save them to a variable, uh, including the one that I just put up here. If you wanted to save this to a variable because you needed a 103 later, you can totally do that. So exercise four, I didn't put this as its own explanatory section, but I wanted us to kind of go over this together. Now, whether or not you're going to eventually use Python as your main calculator over your regular calculator app, that's up to you. But um, <laughs> just keep in mind that the order of operations still applies in Python. Uh, and for most programming languages too. And Python is no exception. So Python follows what's called order precedence. Uh, specifically, we call that PEMDAS. So any operations in parentheses, I know this might be the view for everyone, but um, any operations in parentheses take precedence followed by exponents, uh, multiplication and division, and then addition and subtraction. Um, some of you in grade school might remember that as please excuse my dear and Sally. Um, that's how I still remember it because that's easier for me. Uh, so. So don't judge. But uh, to give an example of how that works out here in Python. So this line of code here is four times three plus four. If we run that, that gives us 16. And that's what's expected. But now, while that was straightforward, let's instead put parentheses around three plus four, uh, the part three plus four in that same operation. And then let's see if that still gives us 16. And it does not. So this is just to show you that order of operations does apply in Python. So just keep in mind in the parentheses while you're doing your math. So in this case here, it, this turned into four times seven because the three plus four took precedence and it was computed before everything else. Okay. Now I'd like to just go back to talking about variable types. And this is especially important when trying out math in Python. Specifically, I want to go over an example of how you can represent the number five in at least three different types. And we'll start with two. You should understand that if we mix variable types in Python, but other, also other programming languages, that can lead to errors and unexpected output. Let's make a variable num1 equals five and num2 equals 5.0. From this, you can see that num1 is an integer while num2 is a float. And if we play this, execute the cell, this is just going to initialize the variables. So what happens when we add these two things together? So the, or to word the question differently, what happens when we add a float and an integer together? Um, that's going to give us 10.0. And as you can see, that means that the result is a float. Uh, so something to keep in mind, and this might be useful for the project for all we know, but what this means is that for any operation that uses a float type in Python, the default type of that result uh, is also going to be a float. So the example that I showed earlier, when we try to add uh, the integer num1 and the float num2 together by addition, we get 10.0 and not 10. Even though, as we all know, 10 is a whole number, we still get 10.0. So that's one simple example of mixing two uh, types together. But now let's talk about the third type to represent 5. And uh, this can be where we can get an error. So the third variable that I want to discuss is called num3, and let's assign it a variable of five in double quotes. So when I do that, that's going to give us a string. So num3, despite its name, is uh, going to give us a string. So now what happens if we try adding num3 with num1? So basically, what do we do? Uh, what do we get when five plus uh, double quotes five uh, if we add them together by num1 plus num3? Um, this is not what you want. So what we get here is called a type error. And the, the error here, you don't need to worry too much about the, the, the specific jargon of this. But when it says unsupported operand type 4 plus int and str, um, the type error that we get here as a result, um, it's not going to be 10 or 10.0. But um, we, we receive a type error because Python doesn't allow you to perform math operations with an integer and a string together. So because num1 was an integer and num3 was a string, 
even though you know just visually that five is a number, but because it was wrapped around um, double quotes, that becomes a different type in uh, coding. So in that case, this gives us a type error, uh, even though the string represents a, a different character. So the same goes for if we were to combine num2 and num3. So earlier we had num2, which is a float. And here's the question, is the output any different? Nope, because, well, kind of, instead of saying in, it says float here, but we still get the type error. So this just, again, goes to show there are certain types we cannot mix together. And I just wanted to give a simple example of it by using a number that we recognize and that we can represent three different ways. So there is one workaround that I don't want to get too much into because, again, like I said, later this week, we're going to be talking more about functions. Um, one way you can kind of work around this is to use what's built into Python that uh, converts uh, different types. Um, so the built-in floats parentheses and int parentheses functions are ways to convert uh, different types. Uh, so if we were to convert that num3, which is a string, that double quotes five, and wrap it around or wrap the int function around num3, that becomes now an integer. So if we took that one and added num1 together, num1 is the uh, the integer that we created earlier, we hit the play button, now it works. So now we don't get a type error, now we actually get the output of five, or output of 10, five plus five. And again, I don't wanna go over too much of the intricacies of these uh, type conversion functions, but um, just know that in this specific example, this works because we had a string that was convertible to begin with. So a fourth way to represent five is the word F-I-V-E. But unfortunately, we cannot uh, convert that because that's a word and not a number. So if we hit the play button here and we try to run um, int num3, we get the value error. Um, again, you don't need to worry too much about the errors here, but that just means there's no way of knowing uh, how to convert uh, F-I-V-E. Uh, I had another question here uh, from Stephanie. What would what would have happened if you had done int um, 10.5? So if I did int 10.5, even if this was set to variable, I could have done the same thing. I'm gonna uh, comment this out. I'll explain that in the next section. But if I did int 10.5, this gives us 10. So if you took a float and try to convert it into uh, an integer, it basically takes out everything that is right at the decimal point. It doesn't round up, but it just kind of takes off the 0.5 part and turns it into a 10. And that's what we see here. Um, but very good question, Stephanie. Thank you for bringing that up. Now for recap, we give an introduction to Python and some of the basics, which includes printing outputs uh, and forming some basic math uh, but a little bit of a detour here that I want to talk about is adding comments to your code. It's something that I'm wanting to show early because I recommend picking up the habits uh, as soon as uh, you learn coding. The reason why you want to add comments in your code, or at least the purpose of it, the many purposes is you can use it to describe the functionality of your code. Um, you can set reminders to uh, kind of fix an, an existing issue in your code. So you can have a comment on there that has like a to-do list or you can clarify some details uh, of your code for yourself and others. So there are many uses of comments. So in order to create a comment here, you're gonna use, okay, let's see. So I know the symbol has many names, but I'll just use the one that's now like more popular for better or worse, uh, a hashtag. So if I were to use a hashtag and when the Python interpreter sees the syntax, it doesn't run uh, that as code and instead recognizes it as a comment instead. So for example, if I had the math operation two plus five, we could add a comment on here that describes what this performs. So the comment that I added here after the hashtag was adds two to five, so we get seven. This is a no brainer, but this is just a simple example of creating comments in your code. Um, so if I play it, we're still gonna get seven and it's not gonna output anything here because like I said, once Python sees that hashtag, it recognizes that as a comment and doesn't try to run anything from there. You can also put it on a separate line. So I have the same example here, but the comment that I put is now in its own line. And when I run this code, again, we get the same error-free output uh, because of Python's recognition of the um, hashtag. So you can also use the syntax for code you may not want to execute, but maybe save for later revision. 
Uh, if you want to do that, you just simply add the hashtag at the beginning of the line that you wish to comment. In this example here, I had two, I originally had two print statements and I commented out this line of code so you won't see the statement printed is the first line. And then the second line is there should be one line printed for the cell and it should be this one. This is very meta here, but if I were to print this first one, that means I only get the second one, the second print statement, meaning I only get the second sentence. Uh, there should be one line printed from the cell and should be this one. Sorry, I just had a question here. Uh, no, so you cannot put a hashtag at the very end of the code. It doesn't turn into a comment. So let's just run a quick exercise here. Uh, earlier, we already established that the percent sign. I guess I have a quick question. If you put a hashtag at the end of the line, will you get an error message though? Well, if we try it here, we do not. Um, awesome, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so this gives us the remainder. And so one, one comment that we could put in here, there's no, um, there's no one way to kind of write this out, but we can just say um, the remainder from 25 divided by seven. And this would still be valid code. Uh, and by the way, um, there are also multi-line comments in which you can use a pair of three quote signs. And so in between the pair, you write more long form text or explanations. I, I don't have an example of that here, but um, you can ask me in the breakout room, I can give you an example. It's just not something you absolutely need to know at this moment, but Overall, commenting your code is a good habit to build. So for those who do end up you know, with a position or a career with some programming or data science, more often than not, you're gonna write code that if you don't write comments or make good documentation of at that time, it's gonna become difficult to read after a while of not looking at that same code. So what I mean is the code you write in the present moment might look almost foreign to you months later without making those same important annotations about specific lines that you know you're gonna forget uh, what it accomplishes in a few months. And especially for the hackathon, if you're sharing that code with others, they'll probably ask you questions about certain lines of code and you can save both yourself and that person some time by commenting whatever script or notebook you gave that person. So that's why I make it a point to talk about it here. Uh, hold on, I got some chat here. Uh, the person you are most likely to collaborate with around your code is yourself in six months. If you love yourself, comment your code. Yes, good point, Dave. Beck. Thank you for for that. Yes, and I and I know I know Dave that we have both experienced in that same situation uh, many times. So thank you for adding that comment. <laughs> uh, so let's step back a little and just to recap, what we covered was writing Python code uh, and talking about some of the basics. But one thing I want to point out is uh, we didn't talk about yet about what does it mean to run Python. And what we're doing here is just one way to run Python. And uh, Google Colab, what we have here, is certainly not the only way to develop in Python. Whether that's the best way, that's going to be entirely subjective to the domain or situation. Um, this is just one of the many ways. So remember that in, in terms of learning how to code, you know, all code before uh, it is translated by the computer is just written text. So what I mean is if you were to open up Notepad on Windows and write some lines of code, it doesn't exactly run that code right then and there, does it? It needs to go through the Python interpreter to be able to execute it. Uh, and that's kind of what I mean by um, uh, this overarching question. So down here is just a list of examples that I put for reference that you guys can look at later, but just to give you an idea of the many ways that Python has been utilized. I mentioned earlier at the, the end of the, the opening ceremony that because uh, uh, Chris from Micron and um, uh, Yvonne and Leo from Dow uh, gave uh, their endorsement to Python, I don't have to be as convincing of telling you that Python is a, a good thing to learn, but here's some examples of what you could do with it. Now, this can be something as simple as running individual lines inside of an interpreter shell, or as a quick, quick script, or as something like a full-fledged, uh, app running on your desktop. There's an iOS app there, app that, out there called Pythonista. It's been on the App Store for a couple of years, and this allows you to not only write and execute Python code on your phone, but it even lets you write scripts for other supported apps. Uh, the link here uh, is uh, for you to learn more about it, but the point is to show you where you might find this language being utilized. Um, and you can see it's almost everywhere. 
And you don't need to understand every example that I just listed off. But again, this is just to show you some of the uh, possibilities for where you might find Python. And there's definitely a lot more to learn Python. So even after the, the five tutorials that we're going over today, we're still going to say there's a lot more to learn in Python. So we can't teach you everything there is to know about coding one week, um, just like how none of us can learn everything there is to know about chemical engineering in one, one week. At least I'm sure that's what I think. But um, so regardless of skill level, you know, if you have questions during these tutorials, I mean, we'll certainly do our best to answer them regardless of the skill level, because we know there are a bunch of uh, questions that come in along the way. And, uh, you know, for some of you there, you might be sitting there right now, maybe if you're past this level, you might be thinking, you know, this is really basic and beginner level. And you're exactly right, because that's exactly the point. So no coding experience is expected or required. That's what it says on the front page of the CHAT website. We're trying to invite everyone into this hackathon and the tutorials this week are meant to build on each other. So for those same people with that existing coding experience, we hope that there's something new that you'll learn this week uh, when it comes to Python. All right. So now let's move on to talking about interactive notebooks. So I just went over one of the many ways or the many ways that you can run Python. So let's focus and hone down on one of the ways, which is the interactive notebooks. And that's going to be what we're going to use um, uh, today. So for interactive notebooks, those are what we have here is a self-contained collection of interactive code or text cells that can be modified. And you can think of them like a scientific notebook. Um, so the thing I put in bold here that I want to make sure you remember is by allowing us to combine code with formatable text images or uh, interactive data visualizations, this gives us a great way to share and collaborate with others on our work. To kind of explore that, we're going to, again, hone down on this interactive notebook and talk about Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so Jupyter Notebooks uh, is based on what's called Interactive Python or IPython. Now, to talk about this whole kernel and engine running behind the scenes to make this all possible, that requires a lot of discussion that deals with uh, computer science knowledge and terminology that just isn't something you know we should discuss right now with what we're trying to discuss. But um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that this is where the IPYMB extension comes from. So the extension that you found here, uh, this I dot IPYMB, that comes from interactive Python. Uh, the extension itself and where the kernel is. So the uh, the notebook the notebook format itself this allows for more ideal presentations of uh, ideas and data analyses over just plain text or code comments that I covered earlier. So what I'm going to cover here is just a, a few examples of uh, some things that you can do. By no means do you have to understand any of this, but this is just to show you some examples. So earlier we talked about running code cell or initializing variables in a code cell, and you can do that here. We can also write functions that can be used later on in a, in a notebook. Um, and then we could also do something like visualization, such, such as scatter plots, uh, heat maps, and charts. Um, and they can all be uh, generated directly inside this notebook, meaning it's not going to pop up as a separate window. It's not going to pop up um, somewhere in a new tab. It's going to be generated right below the cell through that. I'm glad that ran fast. I, I remember earlier this ran like in like 30 seconds as opposed to like two seconds here. So that's good. So we didn't have to wait on that. Uh, you don't have to understand everything that's going on here. I'm just giving you an example of one of the capabilities that you can, um, uh, you'll find with Jupyter Notebooks. So in, in this case, I'm just giving kind of a, uh, an example of using uh, this machine learning package in one of the data visualization libraries that um, is going to be covered later on this week. And then some other examples I've listed down here uh, are uh, just other ways you can think of Jupyter Notebooks being utilized. So reports on data analyses, just straight up uh, data visualizations, technical writing, scientific research with code, and then what we're doing right here, tutorials for students in a hackathon. That, that's the, the benefit of Jupyter Notebook. Now, before I dive into these next sections, which are going to be almost repetitive and self-explanatory, uh, before we dive into those, I recognize that I know I haven't mentioned the term Google Colab, which is the, what we're looking at right now. I've only talked about the term Jupyter, but don't worry, I'll connect those two terms together towards the end. But for now, just keep your attention on working within this notebook. Okay, so code cells. We already saw a bunch of code cells earlier. And so to basically create one, you can either go up here to the insert 
and then select code cell. Uh, so that's one way to create a code cell, or you can hover your mouse down to the bottom of the cell. And when you do that, you're going to see these two buttons pop up and then you can click on code cell here, tech cell, um, and that should create a code cell. Okay. So, so far in this tutorial, you've been creating entirely new code cells and, ex and executing them from a few exercises. So let's edit an existing cell of Python. So remember, we had our first exercise that printed hello world as the output. So let's try to have to edit a code cell because the way it is right now, uh, this is going to give us an error. So let's hit the play button here. Um, we get what's called the syntax error, unexpected EOF while parsing. EOF stands for end of file. Uh, so the exercise here is what do we need to do to edit it to make it run successfully? As you can see, we have that left parentheses, but we don't have the right one. So we need to include that in order for us not to get that error anymore. So let's play it again. And that's just one example of editing code cell. And this is one example of running code and one benefit of running code in notebook rather than using a single .py file. So that means you can create separate code cells and execute and debug each portion of your code separately and as needed. That means further that you can troubleshoot certain lines of your code without, running, without having to run the entire uh, uh, line of code every time without having to run all of your code that you've worked on. So let's talk about text cells. Uh, as the name suggests, a text cell is meant for information and instructions. So instead of us having to write code, uh, the purpose of the text cell is to have information. And what we just showed you was all a bunch of text cells already. Um, so in order to create one, you uh, kind of like with a code cell, you go to the insert here uh, in the top menu and select text cell, or you can hover your mouse over to the bottom uh, the bottom center and select text. And you can edit any existing cell by double clicking on it uh, and editing the code. So if I were to double click on this one right here, uh, we can edit it as, uh, as we would like. Um, and then to make it appear again like the way it's represented, you can just click out of it or hit um, uh, Control Enter or Shift Enter. So depending on what surface, uh, purpose it needs to serve, I mean, you can have you know, multiple cells that describe a certain data pipeline or a list of external links. Uh, in an extreme example, you can have one word per cell, but I generally don't recommend that. I can imagine if you try to type code, uh, text cells that way to the breakout room helpers, they probably won't like that either, or even the people <laughs> who are evaluating the project. So maybe you shouldn't do that, but this is just a, a point to make here. Um, so this next exercise, exercise seven, uh, let's just create a very UW text cell. So the point here is to create a simple text cell that reads the official tagline of UW. If you were to click on this, you would get the tagline of Um, Yeah, sorry, spoiler alert. But if I were to add a text cell here, um, that gives us the editor for the text cell. And um, some of these symbols might look familiar, like as you would if you were to edit like a Word document, uh, a Google Docs page, or a WordPress page. Um, but in this case, we're not going to do any adjustments for now. Um, I'll just call it be boundless. OK, and then I'm going to. Uh, run the cell. Now, if you notice, it does get a, a give a preview here. So you can see what it looks like even before you make it official. OK, and there's a code cell. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about uh, marketing. Sorry, I'll just check with Nida and Evan if you got any questions. Mm -hmm. um, I did not. Evan, a million? Nope. 10 million. All right, OK. <laughs> I think you're good to go, Justin. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so text cells support markdown syntax. And this is a way that you can render and format plain text. And this gives us more control as a way to design our text with beyond just, you know, plain uh, representations of it. So just beyond the visual. A markdown is optional, but it enables you to transform and uh, annotate your text in a way that if you can think of it like as within a web page or here in a Jupyter notebook, it improves readability. Um, and gives you, uh, at the start, just a set of formatting conventions that's easy to learn or write. And I will say right now that Markdown is a super set of HTML, um, just to throw that uh, out there. But um, discussing HTML is beyond the scope of this tutorial. So instead, I have links below uh, later in the notebook to uh, provide you some resources on HTML if you want to 
learn more about that, but that's not required to learn Markdown. So this exercise just dives right into it, dives right into Markdown. So the first exercise is creating a new text cell below the official UW tagline like before, only this time let's add four, five hashtags at the beginning of the line. Um, from the output, how does the symbol change the format of your text compared to earlier? Um, so I'm gonna create a text cell here. I'm going to include the boundless again. And then at the beginning, um, I'm gonna add those five hashtags. Hold on a second. Let's see. Oh, I think I might've had this uh, problem before, I think when I was trying this in Jupyter Notebook instead of Google Colab. So I, in this case, I'm just gonna have the one hashtag, but if you notice here, uh, it creates it as a header. So if I run this, then we see this as a header. So instead of it look, looking as the same font size, we have it represented as a heading here. And so next, instead of using just a hashtag, let's try adding two asterisks both before and directly after the tagline. So again, I'm gonna add a new text cell here, the same um, tagline, be boundless. And then I'm gonna add um, two asterisks both before and after. So you notice it becomes bold. So that's what the two asterisks do is that it creates it as a bold. Now, yes, we have it. Uh, we have this button here that turns into bold, but um, as a way to learn markdown syntax, this is the way to do that also is the, the two asterisks. Okay. And then finally, um, let's add a inequality sign at the beginning of the UW tagline. I think grade school, I learned this as alligator sign and a new empty uh, text cell. Sorry, that meant to say uh, text cell, not code cell. Um, so how does this symbol then change the text output? So again, I'm gonna create a new text cell here. And then um, if I put in the alligator, let's see, hold on. If I put in the alligator sign here and do be boundless, you'll notice that there's this uh, gray vertical line that appears. So what this does is that this creates whatever text you have in front of it as a block quote. Um, this might be useful if you're referencing, uh, if you're quoting some article or uh, quoting somebody that this might come in handy. Um, but this is just another syntax that you can use if you want to use block quotes. So there was a, a question, a very good question that Stephanie noted out. Um, so in a code cell, so yeah, earlier I did try the, uh, the hashtag in a text cell. So just keep in mind that in a code cell, if you do multiple uh, hashtags, that's still gonna be a comment, okay? And later on in the breakout section, you'll learn uh, more formatting syntax with Markdown. And I, I do recommend at the very least trying out Markdown, but on just like a blank Jupyter notebook, because that's gonna give you a way to just experiment with all the different formatting uh, that it has to offer. And the, the reference section that I have here later um, gives you, that I'll, that I'll go over later, is gonna give you a list of resources to learn more. Uh, so this is the last exercise, but um, just a reminder, please double check the, the type of cell you're running in the Jupyter Notebook. I'm just gonna say this word for what's inside here, but um, it can be easy to mistakenly write something in a code cell when you actually wanted a text cell instead. So for example, if you look at this, what happens when you hit the play button on this particular cell? So the problem here is that we get a syntax error because we accidentally put this in a code cell because Python, or sorry, Jupyter Notebook thought that you were running Python code. And obviously this was not meant to be Python code, it's supposed to be in text cell. So just keep that in mind if you accidentally uh, hit one button or the other mistakenly. Um, so, uh, and, and it's easy to kind of convert it too. And then, um, cause I think even in Jupyter Notebook, uh, you can just convert it uh, just right away or you can copy and paste it. Some other details on Jupyter Notebooks that I put here is just keep in mind, cause I know we're putting this on the web browser, but if you want to think like outside, if you're running like developing locally on your computer, Jupyter Notebooks, don't just work with web browsers. There are integrated development environments out there like Visual Studio Code that have these uh, extensions that you can install that allow you to create and run uh, these uh, Jupyter Notebooks right on the other. And Python is actually isn't the only language supported by Jupyter. So you can also run 
notebooks with R and Julia as well. Those are two other data science languages. So you have to add specific computing engines for them, but I'm just giving you a heads up. Jupyter is not just for Python. Uh, and then lastly, uh, for notebooks, both in Jupyter and Google Colab, um, you can integrate them directly with GitHub repo. So if you're ever um, kind of building a GitHub repo, uh, you can connect these notebooks pretty easily. Um, so then this uh, kind of brings it back to what we're looking at right now. So what does this all have to do with Google Colab? So I've just been talking about Jupyter Notebook, but I haven't really talked about Google Colab per se. Um, and the simple answer is that Google Colab is based on Jupyter Notebook. So everything we're doing here, both the notebook platform and this machine that we're technically running on, that's what you see here on the top right where you see RAM and disk, that's hosted right on the Google Cloud platform running in your web browser. So locally, there's no need to install Python or any external libraries on your computer. And this also means that if we were to do this on the cloud, then that also means that the person we're trying to share and work our code with, they also do not have to install any local Python installation or have any external libraries that our shared notebook may rely on. And so that's why, therefore, uh, finally, that that's why we are using Google Colab for C Hack 2021. And this includes all the tutorials and projects. And as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to invite this for everyone out there. So you can even technically try to run this project on your phone. And uh, you can do that because it's all uh, on the cloud, uh, on the web browser. And as a reminder, uh, you can view our information about the setup uh, at this website. This is the specific link, uh, chack.org slash setting up. So Google Colab, as a note, it, it comes with uh, external Python libraries pre-installed. And you've seen an example before of it uh, when I uh, back in the cell over here. Um, some of the libraries that you'll see here and that you're going to see later include NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, and Matplotlib. You don't need to know about what any of these six do for now, but just know that this is what's included with Google Colab. So you don't have to worry about installing these for the uh, hackathon because they're already there for us. So to uh, view the full list of install packages, you just run this command. I include this just to show you, but uh, the exclamation points at the at the beginning and both this this command itself. Uh, this is outside the scope of the tutorial, but if you ever want to run this sometime, this gives you just a list of the the list of the external libraries out there here included with the uh, Jupyter Notebook. This, so Google Colab also allows you to upload files either directly from uh, this icon here with this button uh, or sorry, I'm bring back the table of contents or uh, from Google Drive to so use inside a notebook. So one last note that I'll make about Google Colab before we uh, before I talk about the um, the resources and then eventually the breakout room is uh, these notebook files can also be shared and edited collaboratively in real time, like other document types in the Google Drive uh, slash workspace ecosystem. So for those of you familiar with Google Docs and uh, Google Forms and Google Slides, um, it works kind of the same way here. So the share button up top uh, allows you to invite others to edit, and you can adjust the view and editing permissions. You can also review the um, revisions history of a notebook. So this all changes, say, if you click on it, it will take you to a a new screen that gives you like the revision history. And then under file, uh, you can quickly save and download the Jupyter Notebook. OK, so we'll worry about the breakout in just a bit. But uh, the last one I wanted to show you was this section, jumping into the fourth, fourth section. Um, I decided to kind of give you a list of resources for learning more about everything we just covered here. So this whole hour, and I guess now it's 10 minutes, I can't cover everything there is about Python or Jupyter Notebook or Markdown, but here's some more resources to kind of get you started to learning more. And uh, in the Python section, I have not only the official Python website, but the documentation, some courses I recommend, um, uh, this free data science handbook, another notebook from UW Direct. And same with Jupyter Notebook, I have the official website, the documentation, and this uh, open source book. And then down here for Markdown, uh, I have a guide on Markdown, the Markdown guide um, here. These are all external links. And then just a, an article about Markdown versus HTML. 
Oh, and then here's what I hinted at earlier. What I briefly mentioned earlier is just the list of the uh, math operators in Python that uh, I think you're running to um, uh, most often. All right, thank you so much, Jesse, uh, for a great intro uh, to Python. So um, everyone, we're gonna have the breakout session right after this, and we recommend that you stay connected simply because uh, Nida, our break room headmaster, is gonna be putting people in different breakout rooms and it'll be more complicated if you leave and come back. So you can leave your videos off, you know, and just, uh, I think since it's 640, we'll come, if you can all come back here at 7 p.m., uh, then we'll do the breakout rooms uh, then. And by the way, I'll be at the breakout rooms too. So if you had any questions, we'll, we'll take the break, but if you had any questions about what I discovered, I'll be at the breakout rooms to, to try and answer them, but. Yeah, yeah, oh, one other thing, that's a good point, Jesse. Um, if you have questions and maybe you see this video after or something like that, uh, feel free to Slack them uh, on the C-Hack uh, Slack uh, tutorials channel. Or if Slack is still uh, not in how to treat something. Slack is still, yeah, <laughs> awake by the end of tonight. <laughs> But in the meantime, enjoy your uh, your break. I think it's always good to get a break after uh, long but amazing tutorial talks. And in the chat, I just put the links to the uh, updated Google Colab loading files that Evan created. So just so everyone can see it. But again, I'll put this, uh, I'll send an email out about it later. All right. Thank you, everyone.